I'm Val Munro. Um, now the question of why do I love Jesus? Jesus is my closest friend. He is closer to me even than my own breath. And he's my helper, my guide, my saviour. He is the one and only one who offers us eternal life. And more than that, his promises are just so um, helpful and there are, do you know there's over seven and a half thousand promises in the Bible and all of them, um, he's trustworthy. He, he, there's not one promise that I know of that has not been um, true to what he has promised. Um, for example, he says, I'll never leave you or forsake you and that has been so precious to me. Um, I'm going to give a few examples of why Jesus has become my best friend and so close to me. Some people say that God and religion is just a prop, but I don't mind them saying that because if I've got a broken leg, I really want a prop. It's such a help. And Jesus is just such a help to me in my life day by day. A little bit of background. I was brought up in a, um, in a Christian family. And so I've really grown up loving Jesus. But there was a point when I was about 13 years of age when I went to probably my first Easter camp, um, youth camp, and was given the opportunity, there was an invitation to make a public declaration of your faith in God and in Jesus. And so I stood and made that public declaration at that time, acknowledging that I had sinned and that Jesus had paid the penalty for my sin. I haven't always followed strongly after God and especially I think when I left home and went to teachers college, it was a residential teachers college away from home and I decided then I'm going to find out a bit more about what other people in the world, the way they live um, and not just follow because well I mean I would made that decision but it was following the way that I'd been brought up and what my parents believed. And so I went to parties a little bit, and, um, but there were, there were people in my hostel, my hall, at Teachers College, one especially who would always um, ask me to come to the Christian meetings. And I felt that I was not just following the ways of the world, but I was still believing in God. And so to please her, I suppose, as much as anything else, I would often go to those Christian meetings as well. And it was at one of those Christian meetings, actually, um, we had wonderful Bible teaching um, guest speakers come. And I remember one time when after a meeting, Christian meeting, just thinking, God is just so good. And walking away from that meeting in the evening back to the hall, feeling as though I was on cloud nine and thinking, God is so good. I just want to, he loves me and I love him and I just want to serve him. Um, so that was a point of real recommitment to God. And from there on, I have fairly consistently um, sought God's ways and sought to please him. I'm Murray Monroe and uh, I love Jesus because Jesus is my older spiritual brother. I say that because when I accepted Jesus Christ as my saviour, I came into God's family and, and uh, Jesus is God's son. I just want to share with you now my growth and, and my journey with Jesus. Um, I, grew, I lived in the, with my mum and dad and two older brothers in a farm house in, in Tipuki. And um, there was a saying around that you never talked about religion or um, politics. And at the same time, though, we were sort of neither for nor against Christians or Christianity. However, um, at one stage, my mother decided that she'd like to run a Sunday school in her home. And uh, so some of the children from neighbouring farms came to that Sunday school. And the main thing that I remember from that was memorising passages of scripture such as uh, 1 Corinthians 13 and the Beatitudes and um, uh, things such as that, um, yeah, oh yeah, the 23rd Psalm and so on. Um, 
However, and the next thing that took place in my life in this sort of spiritual journey was that I attended a confirmation class. And um, so I received a confirmation certificate, but I really wasn't a born-again Christian. So I, as I said, our family weren't against Christianity, so in my time at Teachers College, I, um, I attended the ch a church every so often with a friend and also um, helped even with Sunday school there. And the next thing in my life was that uh, as a new teacher, I arrived at this North Hokianga town of Broadwood and um, went to <coughs> a service there, a Methodist service, and I was just blown away by the excitement, the joy of the people in this church compared with what I had experienced before. At the same time, I'd met Val and uh, spent time with her family and got to realize that really, um, to really be a fully committed Christian, one needed to make some sort of make a public statement. And the usual thing in those days was for that age of a person was to go to the uh, go to a Easter camp. And so, uh, in 1961, I prepared for that. The main thing I remember from that is, as a school teacher, I was concerned that <clears throat> my swearing would not uh, overflow at, at all and be a bad example to the children and uh, to anyone in my family in the future. And so I wanted to really deal with that in accepting Jesus Christ as my Saviour. And so at that Easter in 61, I uh, re repented and accepted Jesus Christ as my Saviour. And so uh, my journey carried on and Val and I got married and um, Val had already had quite a strong sense of calling to be available to go to the mission field. And one evening up in Kai Tai, we went to an evening meeting and heard two missionaries talking about mission work and that sort of reignited all that we had discussed about this before. And so because of that, um, <clears throat> Uh, we got advice from the Baptist pastor up there and uh, he said, well, the first thing really, if you're sensing a call this way, is to go to Bible college. And so we did a two-year uh, training course there. I did another two years of theological training. And then we applied to be missionaries of the Borneo Evangelical Mission. And um, so we finally got over to the field in 1970. And I suppose I would like to say that this is quite a, a pinnacle in uh, my experience with Jesus Christ. The story actually started when I was only about 10 years of age. I had an uncle who was um, home on what we now call um, home assignment from his mission work in the Solomon Islands. And one day, as I was a young person, as I said, my parents had had to go um, away and were not able to be there for the milking and Uncle Alistair had to, was getting, doing the milking to fill in for my dad and I was helping him in the shed and I vividly remember at the end of the milking he said to me in a conversation he said how would you respond if God wanted you to be a missionary and I was quite shocked I thought missionaries were very special people he would never ask me to be a missionary I'm just a young guy, a girl at that stage, just an ordinary person. They would have to be special people. However, I just, that question went deep into my being and I pondered on it a long time and, and decided during that process that if God did ever ask me to be a missionary or ask me to be anything, do anything special for him, I would want to say yes to him. That just lay in my being for some years. And then Murray and I met. This was um, when I, just before I went to Teachers College, and Murray was already teaching actually. Um, and then he proposed to me and asked me to marry him. This was actually during my later on, my first year at Teachers College. And it wasn't until after I'd said yes. And we had um, agreed, and Murray had already spoken to my parents, and we'd agreed to become engaged, to be married, although my parents had said that I must wait until I'm at least 21. I was quite young when I got engaged, um, before we could get married. So that was going to be another two years away. 
but it was at that stage that it just came flooding back to my mind. What about your, so I called it a promise to God, that I would be a missionary if he called me and I didn't know whether he was going to call me to be a missionary or not. And if I got married, how could I say yes, especially if my husband did not get the same call or was not prepared to say yes also. So that ended up in quite a um, challenging time for Murray and I as I shared this with him. He was living quite some distance away at that time and so there were letters and there were phone calls and we only were able to meet occasionally. At any rate, I said to him, I really do want to be free to say yes to God and I want to know the answer to that question, whether what he wants me to do for him. Um, and I said, and yes, I want to be a missionary if that is his purpose for me. I said, if you are not don't feel that you could say yes if God called you to be a missionary, then maybe we should suspend our, suspend our engagement um, and maybe if God calls me, I could be free to go and serve him as a missionary, perhaps just for three or four years and then come back and could marry you if you still wanted to marry me then. <laughs> um, this turmoil went on for quite a while Murray really sought God too in prayer and he came back to me one day and he said if God called me or us to be missionaries I would say yes I want to be a missionary also I want to serve him so that brought con a conclusion to our turmoil and I felt we, we could happily announce our engagement and um, then it, as it turned out uh, God did speak to us later on after we were or just before we got married before we got married actually he spoke to us both clearly that he was calling us to be missionaries we Murray and I became um, missionaries went out to Sarawak um, which is the Malaysian part of the large island of Borneo and when we went first went to the mission field we went out by boat by ship it was um, expected to be about a four-week journey from Melbourne. We flew over to Melbourne. Um, we had two children at that time, and I was pregnant with the third child. Um, but as we, I'm just cutting this journey, there are many things I could tell you about that journey and other things in my life, but just very briefly, when we were approaching Jakarta, it was a part cargo and part passenger ship, and we were going to be calling into Jakarta to offload some cargo. And as we were approaching the Jakarta harbour, the ship ran aground. It, it missed the entrance into the harbour and ran aground on a mud bank there. We were stuck there for nine days, um, or ten days, I think it was. But when we ran aground there, the ship went on a slope as it got stuck in the mud bank and we were on a quite a sharp incline like this. It was in the evening and we were told everybody must come up onto the top side of the deck. Um, we did that but our two children were asleep in our cabin down on the bottom side of the deck of the ship, um, down in the cabin. And we asked some of the crew, look, can we go and get our children? They said, no, nobody has to go down on that bottom side. You must stay up on the top side. The crew were walking around with life jackets on, but they didn't give any to the passengers. And they were saying, this ship cannot tip over. You're safe, you'll be all right. But we had just come from the Wahine um, disaster in Wellington Harbour, where a ship sank in that little harbour. And so we were not so convinced. Finally, they did allow us to go down and get our children and bring them up onto the top part of the deck. Um, the, we were there for, as I say, for 10 days. They had to get not only tugboats from um, Jakarta to try and pull us off, but tugboats came from Singapore to try and get us off at high tide. Finally, we got off, but when we got off the, pulled off the sand bank, the mud bank, the ship lurched over the other way. They'd been unloading cargo um, from the hold and from the tanks down below, but they'd forgotten to f um, balance it with water. 
um, when they'd unloaded the cargo and so it had flipped over the other way. It was quite frightening but God was there with us and we got us safely through and we continued the journey to um, Sarawak. We actually got off the ship in Singapore and flew the last part of the journey. Uh, another thing, I have a fear of spiders. We lived and worked in, in Asia for 11 or 12 years and in the tropic, those tropical countries there are many creepy crawlies, including spiders, very large spiders, with their leg span being the size of a, well, just about a dinner plate, um, the whole spider. But God gave me the grace and the um, ability to be able to live there um, through that time with, with those um, rather scary creatures for me. Um, one little incident, or could it be a be, been a big incident, it had been raining, it was quite wet underfoot. I was walking from one our place to another place, um, another house, across the grass, and I just in my jandals, and I felt something scratch on the side of my foot. I kicked my foot and the jandal flew off but something else went flying off too and on investigation I found it was a scorpion. I was thankful to God that that scorpion didn't actually sting me even though I'd walked on it and I felt its claws on my foot. There we went to work with the <coughs> Bornean people and uh, their, their, well, they described their religion as animism and um, so uh, because of that, which is, means a fear of, of spirits and you need to appease, the, appease them in various ways. And so one thing of this I first of all want to illustrate is that um, <clears throat> the gospel coming to the Bornean people. Um, there was a group called the Lumuang uh, group, tribe, tribal people. And in those days, way back in the 20s when the first missionaries were there, the local government gave permission as to where they could go to preach the gospel. And so they came to the government official in that area, Limbang, and asked, could we go to the Limbang? And, they, and the government official said, no, uh, no point in going there. They are, are using their rice, which is their food really, using it to make mainly rice wine, and then drunk, and um, drunk most of the time, and, and they're very sick, and they're just going to die out. So no, you can't go there at all. So that was that part of the life uh, situation, but at the same time, God was at work because relatives of the Lumbawang living in Indonesian Borneo, we were in uh, Malaysian Borneo, relatives of there had heard the gospel from missionaries there. And so they, they embraced the gospel and they wanted to tell their relatives over in Borneo. And they came to the Lumbawang and they shared the gospel with them and they brought about a change in the Lumbawang people. Now the whole thing was that, <coughs> with all of this, that um, uh, <coughs> change took place in their lives, but, but the missionaries still couldn't go there. But then they got a request to go up there. So the missionaries and the government officials went up there and were just astounded to see the difference in the Lumbawang people. They were healthy, their village was clean, they were having pre-meetings before they went out to the rice farm, which is their main income uh, for a living, and uh, a pre-meeting at five o'clock in the morning before they went out to the field. And the other thing to il illustrate with all this is how <laughs> the people were feeling being sent, set free because of the gospel was that illustrating like this. Animism, as I said before, was a fear of omens, whether it be a snake or a bird. And one illustration is this, that the um, Bornean people would, um, they, they, had, they live in a village, but their farms would be, say, an hour's walk away from there. And so one example is that they would be on their way down to the farm, and they'd see a snake wriggle across the path in front of them, and that was an omen that the demons were upset with them. They needed to be appeased. So they, they wouldn't go. They wouldn't go uh, down to the rice farm. And, the, and even though they knew that the sparrows would be, and mice would be devastating their rice, their main food, but they'd just go back to their uh, home and, and seek to appease the spirits. And so this lifestyle through an animism was just, um, just, and not helping their lives at all. 
And then going on from there, this is what I feel is quite uh, exciting as well, is that they were the ones that ex embraced Christianity were the first generation uh, Christians, and they were rice farmers mainly, but their children had the opportunity to go to uh, secondary school, and I had an opportunity to minister to them for about a year or so down in Limbang town. And then to see these ones that had the opportunity of education then go on to uh, go further, get further training, get into good jobs in ceramic as well as going over to Kuala Lumpur and train at university. One be trained there as a doctor and then he went to Edinburgh to, became a, be, to become a uh, higher ed, uh, qualified doctor, another one trained to be a lawyer and so on. And so really the gospel made a difference to, to these people and that was so satisfying and exciting that their lives were changed because of what of Jesus Christ coming into their lives. I've seen whole tribal groups being set free from bondage to Satan through our work with the tribal people in Sarawak. They, they were living in filth and squalor. They were unhealthy. They were living their lives just drinking rice beer, having orgies. They were, in fact, the government had said to the missionaries earlier on, just leave them alone to die out. They'd be better off if we just left them. They're not worth trying to save. But God met them. The gospel came to them. And their lives completely changed so that they became living in clean villages. Their health improved. They had purpose in life. And even some of them in the next generation were ed got education and went on to be doctors and lawyers. We have indeed seen the gospel transform people's lives dramatically. Our third child was born um, a few weeks, a number of weeks after we arrived in Sarawak. He arrived um, earlier than we expected and in actual fact at that time our mission had their own flying program and it had been all planned and our mission plane was going to take me down to a, it was actually a Shell Oil Company hospital in, which was part of Brunei country in Syria. Um, but Mark arrived before I'd gone. It had been planned for me to go and stay down in that um, town where there was a hospital 10 days before Mark was due. But he arrived early and our mission plane was out of action. It was broken down. Our pilot actually had to fly to America to get parts to um, bring back for the, for the plane to be fixed. The permission had been in negotiation with a local um, Borneo Skyways company who had their own planes and we had been in negotiation to see whether we could hire one of their planes until our plane was um, able to be used again. That particular morning that particular morning when Mark was born, when our son was born, that plane, Mission uh, Bonnier Skyways plane, happened to, just happened to fly in to our mission headquarters where we were at that stage. And so it was able to take me and Mark because, oh, I forgot to say that I had a, a problem of a retained placenta um, with the birth of Mark. He arrived, but the placenta didn't follow. And so there was that complication. So that plane, was able to take Mark and myself, the baby and myself, down to Surya Hospital where there was um, good help there because um, he was just born in the house in the little um, mission headquarters place where we were. Out of this work of uh, bringing the gospel to the Bornean people came a church named uh, the Sidang in Borneo, the uh, Gospel Church of Borneo. And in the mid-70s, um, revival broke out in that church and especially took place in one place away in the interior but it spread to the uh, rest of um, Malaysian Borneo and the whole thing was to really be a, a part of that in a small way was so exciting just to see what God in his sovereign move can do with the lives of people. Now really revival does mean that something has had life and needs to be revived and so really it is 
um, most it has, is greatly uh, most applied to Christians that they need to be revived. And in the case of, of the Bornean people, they had become uh, uh, more slack in their ways, uh, Lama, as we'd say in Malay, and um, even to the extent that some, and as even, it was pastors especially, that another thing to do with animism, that you, you, you would, um, could have charms. It could be a little stone. Uh, tied up and sewn up in a piece of cloth, and you'd carry that with you to be uh, uh, have um, uh, uh, victory in a debate with other people, and so on, or to be protected, and so on. And what what happened was in the revival, these leaders, these people, and uh, were challenged that they needed to get rid of these charms that they'd held on ever since they'd become followers. And at the same time, for Christians as well, the same sort of thing. They, they realized that, that some of their ways had become very worldly and so on. And so they just needed to uh, be more um, on fire for God. And so really, uh, that having experienced revival, that certainly is, has been a prayer of Val's and mine ever since that time that revival would break out in New Zealand as well. The people themselves, they they just wanted just, just to worship God and, and pray that they, they, um, they would uh, uh, spend whole nights in prayer and praise and so on and, and uh, even we were living in a town of Limbang at that stage and, and there was a, a, an army camp beside us and, and, and even for instance the Christian uh, soldiers who knew they had to go on duty in the middle of the night would come and dressed in the uniform uh, ready to go on duty, but come to pray and praise and and worship, and so there was there was a, 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 a such greater joy of Father God <laughs> in in the uh, lives of these people because of uh, what Jesus was doing in their lives. That church we were working with, the Sidang in Jaborni, and the Gospel Church of Borneo, became it it was became a very exciting example of modern church planting. It really was, uh, became a very flourishing church and even in itself it, that they, they sensed uh, in later years that they wanted to reach out and uh, for instance uh, I don't get all the news from them but I know that they have got uh, missionary in the Philippines and also they moved over to set up churches in West Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur and there were at least 20 SIB churches in that city of, of Kuala Lumpur in Western Malaysia. In 2008, um, I had a major accident, falling off the roof of our two-storey house. I'd been helping Murray paint up there, and I fell down. Everything was very broken in my body, internal injuries and external. I had a big gash on my leg, there were many, many broken ribs, um, broken scapula on the sh back of the sh or shoulder there. Um, both of my wrists were broken, uh, the eye socket was broken, and internally the, my spleen was shattered and had to be removed. When they opened me up, I was absolutely full of blood in that cavity. Um, the liver was all lacerated. It took a long time and for me to come right, but doctors really, they said that even people younger than myself would have died from those, um, that accident, those injuries. But God, and I really had to have active faith during that time. There were times I was nearly three months in hospital after two and a half weeks in intensive care. I had to have a tracheotomy, both my wrists were broken, my ribs were all broken, I was uh, really broken and my sister even visited me and went back to the nurse who had told, told her which bed to go to and she said, that's not my sister, you've got, sent me to the wrong bed, she didn't recognise me. Um, however, today my health is just so good. I've come back with as good a health from that accident or even better than I had before. God was just so good. The recovery, the healing, took time. It took more than two years, but
but it was been so complete. It was just a miracle that it, that I did recover, that I didn't die at that time, and it's been a miracle the way the degree of healing that I received. As I said, there were times when I could have just given up. I felt like as though I could just relax and give up, but I believe God um, want, wanted me to, well, I, I just hung on to him, I prayed to him, I claimed his promises, and um, he obviously has come through for me. Um, the, the extent of the um, injuries, yeah, it, it took two years to, to come right. But as I say, I've just I've got such good health and I'm just so thankful for my God, that he was with me all the way through and I could call on him at any time. Um, maybe some of you are not a child of God and I would encourage you to take hold of, he's, he's giving us, offering us the gift of salvation, of eternal salvation. He has paid the penalty for our sins by his death on the cross. And I'd encourage you to take hold of that and to know him also as your friend and your saviour, your guide, your promise keeper, your helper. And so really, uh, for me, um, Jesus Christ is so very special because of that. I, uh, I, you know, for at least about 20 years, I lived in the world, really. Um, one, foot in the, one foot in the world and one foot a bit in Christianity. And I, I do feel myself, I believe, that really... Uh, the only way is Jesus Christ, to follow his way. The Bible is so, so important in learning how to live and uh, has such good teaching of, to, uh, to live. And as uh, Jesus said himself, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, and, and that really is true. It's the only way to have eternal life.